So I'm sure I'm going to need to introduce it. So that's me. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about sustainable drainage and challenging environments. Uh, and what I want to talk about um, are some of the projects that we're running at the moment. Um, and then obviously these are the people on this project, most of whom uh, you will uh, know. Probably, apart from Kevin, who is from the University of Cape Town. Um, so I've sort of slotted those into tropical climates, informal settlements, refugee camps, and favelas. So I'm, I'm going to start with tropical climates, which is uh, a project that, that, that Martin ran. Um, oh no, I'm not. I'm going to start off talking about what sustainable drainage is, uh, for those of you that don't know. So uh, it mimics natural drainage. And so the idea is that um, we should be able to take the buildings away from the site and the drainage should be exactly the same. So at greenfield runoff rates. Um, so it reduces runoff, uh, it attenuates the storm peak. It does this via uh, individual devices, which I'll just show you a couple of in a minute. Um, or it does this by adding them together to make a manageable train. So it, yes, it manages any environment or some environmental risks uh, due to urban runoff um, and all the problems associated with that. So um, to a certain extent, it will enhance, um, usually it's associated with the urban environment, but it can also be associated with the rural environment as well. It obviously differs from traditional systems, um, which want to take the water all at once and get it out as soon as possible and as quickly as possible. So it encourages uh, the infiltration of water into the ground, um, its detention or retention, um, and its slow conveyance. So how does it do that? So if we take infiltration, the obvious example here is permeable pavement. Um, we take detention, it does this via wetlands and ponds, and ponds can also uh, retain water as well as detain it. And then conveyance is generally via swales and filter strips, so these are vegetated uh, ditches. Um, so this is Hotwood Motorized Service Area, um, this is Northampton, Upton at Northampton, um, and this is the um, Techno Centre. Um, it can also um, include rainwater harvesting, and so this will also uh, detain water, um, and so this can attenuate the storm peak as well. So the thing to notice about these things is that they are multifunctional, uh, that they've got multiple benefits, um, and they're also very flexible in the way that you can apply them. So you can join them together, you can use them individually. I'm also, in this talk, going to include rainwater reuse and management, uh, mainly because in the environments that I'm talking about, uh, rainwater and stormwater runoff get mixed together. Um, and so you, you do end up sort of having to manage them both together. So you can um, put sustainable drainage all together in this uh, suds um, square, um, Oh, I touched it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. um, and this was, this uh, came up, it was the Suds Triangle on time, um, but, it, but it was in the uh, Suds Guidance, which was brought out late 2015. And so you have the equal balance between the quantity of water, so you wish to reduce that, uh, improve water quality, um, you want to provide areas for biodiversity, but also provide areas for, for amenity, for people. Um, so there should be this, this balance. If you think about conventional drainage, they, it basically concentrates just on water quantity. It's more interested in reducing flooding. So a little bit of history. Did you know that porous paving was invented at Coventry University? Did you know that the original work on geotextile and biofilm microecology was undertaken at Coventry University, probably by Steve sitting there? And all the original work on oil degradation was undertaken at Coventry University, uh, probably by Alan, who sat at the back there. And there's an example here of a paper uh, by Alan um, to show that this sort of research is still ongoing. 
So we do have a bit of history in this, this area. Okay, so tropical environments. So this uh, was interesting to me uh, on the project that Martin ran. Uh, we went to Malaysia, uh, a tropical country. In developing tropical countries, there is a lack of infrastructure. Uh, to cope with the sorts of climates that you see here, and to, uh, the intensity and duration of rainfall. Um, there, there is, in a way, the lack of infrastructure is a positive in that you're starting with a clean slate. So rather than having to cope with um, not fit for purpose infrastructure, you can sort of impose things on it. Oh, um, there is a lack of knowledge. And the other problem is, who are we to say, don't do that? We've learned our lessons, and again, we can't even, so the developed world, it's difficult to then say, you know, don't do that, it's, it's not the right thing to do. But there is a lack of money. The other thing that to take into account um, are disease vectors, like mosquitoes and nuisance animals, like this tropical milk snake. So, at the... Uh, University Putra Malaya, where we went, um, they have developed uh, bioecos or bioecological drainage systems which use native veg vegetation in something similar to a swale, which I showed you just a minute ago, um, but it, it, it's, it's a bit more engineered. Um, so there's this storage box. Um, so the water is encouraged through um, the surface and then flows through this storage box. Um, so it's to handle high peak rainfall intensities, um, but also keeping the water under the surface. So there's, no, there's not standing water and you can discourage the breeding of tropical insect pests. So this was you know, of interest uh, when we came to looking at other environments um, that have oh, that had similar problems. So there's a couple of references there. But you can see how clear the water was as it came through the bio -ecod. So if we carry on now and think about the challenging environments I was talking about, informal settlements, um, uh, refugee camps, favelas, when we look at the population uh, living in slums, according to the UN habitat definition of a slum, um, if we look at South Africa, which are the blue, um, reluctant to touch it, which are the blue columns, you can see that the, from 1990 to 2014, the population has reduced, it's sort of leveled out a bit. Uh, Nigeria is on there as well, that's reduced. Um, Brazil, are similarly reduced. But if we look at Iraq from 1990, we can see that the population has gone up um, due to the influx of refugees, particularly from, from Syria, uh, into, into the refugee camps. But even so, say, take South Africa, more than 20% of the population lives in a slum. Uh, Brazil, Again, more than 20%. But in Iraq, it's, it's pushing 50% um, now. So if we start off then by looking at what we're doing in the informal settlements, um, this is with uh, Kevin Winter from the uh, University of Cape Town. Um, and it's based at uh, an informal settlement called Langruch, which is just up the road from Franschhoek, where everybody goes for their wine tasting. Um, and so I'm standing here talking to Sidaly, who's one of his PhD students uh, there. So this is the Friendship Road. Um, the informal settlement is here. And you can see by the um, ISO lines there uh, how steep the terrain is. So this is the, the top of the catchment, or the sort of up around here somewhere, uh, looking down. Um, on Langbrug. Um, Cape Town is here, so we're sort of 80 kilometres to the east. Um, Kevin's got um, what he's calling the water hub down here. Oh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about Langbrug today. 
Uh, as is common with all um, informal settlements, um, the key is in the name, it's informal. The residents have no rights, really. Um, they do lack infrastructure in terms of sanitation. Um, they, they virtually lack altogether drainage and groundwater management. Um, and so you can see, this, we're up the hill, um, and here is um, a stream, of, a mix of groundwater and stormwater. If there is any infrastructure, it's dysfunctional. Um, so, for instance, um, when Steve, Liz and I went in April, uh, we were shown uh, the men's urinal, which was a posting ground that they used. I won't say anymore. Um, so the, the toilets that they've got are drop toilets, and I think there were out of six, there were only a couple that were actually still able to function. Quite obviously, planning is lacking um, because the, the uh, shacks are self-built. They're, you know, if there's a space, you stick your shack in there. Um, and as you can see by that, there's very little waste collection. Um, there could be problems with disease vectors. They don't have uh, malaria there, but you know you still can get biting insects. It's still unpleasant. Um, there are a few formal records kept, so it's quite difficult to work out how healthy people are, if you like. How often do they have to see the doctor? You know, do they have access to a doctor? Uh, and there's certain lack of community. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So. Uh, when I went out there about 15 months ago, um, they put in uh, grey water disposal points um, and whilst we were there a lady came along with her bucket of washing up water or something and put it in one of these. These are set into the ground and then there's, um, underneath the ground there's a, a trench filled with uh, gravel and the idea is that they put the grey water in here and then it gradually dissipates either into the ground or through um, this uh, trench, and then there's a, a soil surface, so you know people can walk on it. The water's kept on the ground. You can plant, put plants in it if you like. But when we went back in April, um, these were actually overflowing, um, and there was quite a lot of rubbish. So this is, you know, th this is why it's, it's it's so challenging to do things uh, in these um, settlements. So this is a nursery, a children's nursery, so you can see the, the playground um, and the climbing frame and whatnot. Um, and then, I guess it's a bit late to say what grey water is, but still, uh, food preparation, personal washing, um, washing your clothes. So it's got all sorts of things in it. I mean, if, you, if you're washing your body, there will be fecal uh, contamination um, and organic matter in it. Um, and this, again, is a stream of that water that's going right through the middle of the playground for the nursery. So these things need tackling, they need dealing with. Um, the Stiebel River runs through the middle, runs through the middle of um, Landbrug. And so this is the bridge that I'm standing on, talking to Sibeli. Um, and you can see the accumulation uh, of rubbish. Oh, sorry. I think I'm going to go back to the buttons. Um, in that the water is polluted, it's got all these things, the grey water that we were talking about, the storm water. Um, it's, it's got all sorts of medication in it, like AIDS medication. Um, so it, it is quite polluted. But what uh, the, the project has, is in two parts. So the one is uh, to monitor biofilters at the water hub. And I did point that out before, that it's down here. So this is the Stiebel River coming underneath where I was standing and down, and then it leads into the um, Friendship River. And it's based on uh, an old wastewater treatment plant. And what it's got, so, so here are the, the the, the old filters are there down here. Uh, here's the Stiebel River coming down into the Friendship River um, with the, well, the roads up there somewhere. Um, and then what Kevin's got are three pairs of huge biofilters um, which he's had cleaned out. 
okay, which he's had cleaned out and he's had filled with a, a, a variety of aggregates and waste material, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the idea of the biofiltration is sort of vaguely based on, so it goes back to Steve and the biofilms that develop on geotextile in the porous pavement. Um, and it's the passage of polluted water through a filter medium and then uh, on which this biofilm will develop. Um, so you will get um, bacteria and fungi, you'll get protists, um, things like the water bear, nematode worms, um, and then this micro-ecosystem um, uses some of the pollutants as nutrients um, and traps some of the others. So, here are the biofilters. So there are three. One, two, and then uh, I'm standing on the other one. So you've got the one at the bottom here. So these are 16 metres long three metres wide and a metre deep, so they're massive. Um, small stone aggregate at this end, it just so happens, there's no logic to why they're that way around. Um, peach stones, they're called peach pips in the middle, and then the one at this end has got a large uh, aggregate in it. Um, this side is unvegetated, this side has got vegetation in it, it's got phragmites, tiffia, papyrus and then whatever else has decided to grow in it. Interestingly, the vegetation in the aggregate looked the same as this, it looked quite healthy, you know, had flowers and stuff. What was in the peach stones just was dead, just completely died. It all put, put together at the same time, um, the, the Stiegel River is um, passed through these, it can go through them separately, it can go through them together. Um, I guess that you know this is something that needs a bit more investigation as to why. So if anybody's got any ideas, that'd be great. And Kevin has some um, preliminary results. So they've monitored flow, water volumes, and then I put water quality because I don't know quite what water quality means. It depends on what the water is going to be used for. But they, they've done some analysis of the, uh, the chemical content of the water uh, at the inlets and the outlets of each individual uh, biofilter. So we've got those are the peach pits, those are the small aggregate, and that's the large aggregate. And this is the water coming in. And so this is. Um, E. coli in coliform forming units per 100 mil. So the influent, to me that looks like quite a lot. <laughs> to Steve, I don't think it does, but. No, it is very it's coliform, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, that's good. <laughs> so that looks like quite a lot. So you've got the large aggregate, the small aggregate. It's almost gone, but then you look at the peach pips. And okay, it's reduced, but it's still not very good. So that those are the. So each of these has got one of these where you could take some water from it and you can also measure flow. So it's got a, 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 a still um, to be able to take samples. So the research questions as far as that is concerned is, is it possible to use these biofiltration cells um, to pass the water through without using chemicals? And will it come out the other end um, and be usable. Um, so this is why they're measuring the flow and volumes to establish optimal <coughs> conditions for the amount of water going through. Um, Steve and Liz went out there to characterise microbial diversity um, and they have developed new technologies for measuring water quality that are cheap and cheerful and they can make themselves. But the idea of all of this is to have water for reuse. Is it safe to do so? Um, as said, of monitoring it, um, and what they're doing is to use it then to irrigate um, small scale uh, produce, small scale um, veg uh, vegetables. And so they did them in these, and this is what we saw when we went there. I wasn't overly impressed, I have to say. It didn't look, you know, that appetizing. But there you go. So they have carrots. No, no, those aren't carrots. They have beetroot. I know those beetroot. But they did have carrots. I don't know what those were. It might have been lettuce. Um, 
Is it the very healthy meaning? Um, and they have quite a lot of them. So this again is, is ongoing and is part of this project. So, you know, is this going to work? The idea is to be able then for the water to be used up in the informal settlement. But you obviously, if, if you can capture it before it gets into the river, that might be the best way of doing it. So what we are doing here, so this is, uh, Peter's been working very hard on this, um, is we've set up 10 stillages in the uh, greenhouses that we are going to, the, oh, so I'm using the world we here, um, Peter mostly, um, fill these with either large or small size aggregate. So the, these are the, the, the stillages that we cut in half, turn that way up, uh, we've got an um, outlet tap at the bottom. Um, they are, what I like about them is it's, it's sort of sustainable because these are, these are recycled, so we're using recycled things. Not so much the aggregate, but still. Um, and then we had huge discussions about what plants to use. Um, anyway, so we've come up with lavender, mesembryanthemum, or ice plant, and aloe, mainly because it, these will survive in the South African climate, number one. Number two, they have other uses. Um, so uh, lavender, you know, obviously you can dry it and sell it. Uh, Mesembryanthemum, you can eat the leaves apparently. I haven't tried, but apparently you can. It's supposed to taste like spinach. Uh, aloe, you can make a disgusting drink out of it, which is good for you. You can make face creams, soap, you know, all that sort of thing. So, you know, thinking of things having multiple benefits, multiple roles. And the idea then is that you perhaps have one of these per two shacks, where and people will be able to then go out and throw their grey water on it, uh, water these plants, um, and then have something else to do with them. But of course the other thing is, will the plants survive and will they take up any of the pollutants? So that's something else that we need to think about. Um, so the other thing that uh, happened while we were away in, in um, looking at the large scale biofilters was that Liz looked at the fungal mycorrhizae. Well, Liz tried to look at the fungal mycorrhizae, but there weren't any. So anyway, um, but that is something else. So that the microecology and fungal mycorrhizae we're going to look at in the um, small scale biofilters once they've got going. And so, well, I put this in here because. That's what these things are, mm -hmm. things and vesicles associated with them. Okay, so that's one project that's ongoing. Uh, the, the, so there was the tropical environments, there was um, informal settlements, and now thirty sudden refugee camps, um, and this is in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, and this is with Andy Adam Radford and Mitch McTuff, who's the master's student. Um, and the aim is to address sort of the same issues again with flooding, as you can see, uh, it is a problem in, in, in these refugee camps, uh, particularly as whilst wash is put in, water sanitation and hygiene, um, drainage as a general rule isn't, or they're putting um, pipes or, or trenches or whatever that, that, that aren't fit for purpose. I mean, if you've got something in like that, it doesn't necessarily work very well. So, yeah, it's a, it, it addresses flooding, uh, it addresses uh, any disease vectors, um, and again, groundwater management, and using sustainable drainage. And this is um, funded by the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. And obviously, this is, this is to tackle the human environment and health problems associated with the lack of drainage and groundwater management. So, if you look at resolution, that resolution uh, by the UN, um, it states that uh, an access to clean, safe drinking water and sanitation is a human right. However, it does not mention floods or drainage. And so the question is, is drainage a human right? Um, drainage is supposed to be encapsulated in wash, but again, it's the rush to put in water, sanitation and hygiene rather than thinking about uh, anything to do with drainage. The new SDG 6 uh, document, 199 pages of it, 
mention, mentions drainage once in 199 pages. It does mention floods, um, but it, it, as I say, drainage once. So where, where again, the Royal We, where are we working? Um, mainly based in Gabbaland, which is in Nineveh, um, sort of vaguely in the corner of the Hook and the Beal. Uh, and the challenges are the same as in informal settlements, uh, in which it's densely populated, waste is always an issue, uh, little drain, little rainwater disposal. But the difference being that it's planned and wash is installed. And because it's planned, there is this opportunity here to change the way that refugee camps are planned, to change policy. And so therefore to have, you know, the, the ref version of impact. So, UNHCR sets up these camps. Once they've set them up and the people move in, then they go on and do other things. So once they're established, it depends on where they are. So uh, the, the various um, governments then take over the management of the people. Uh, so for instance, in the Hook, the Board of Relief for Humanitarian Affairs. Um, so these are the people that Mitch and Andy have been working with um, to talk to them about SUDS, explain what it does, um, <clears throat> and uh, get their buy-in to you know, think about these sorts of things. So, as I said, they set these camps up. It's a bit better now, they don't have blocks of showers and toilets, because uh, there were problems associated with those. So here we have, uh, oh, stop it. So here we have two sort of dwellings and associated with those, um, a block with two toilets and, and two showers, rather than a centrally located one. But it looks fairly bleak. Um, you know, it's somewhere for people to go to in a crisis. They've been bombed out of their homes um, and this, this is, you know, they've got to find somewhere to live. And so that's it. Um, you won't see any drainage here because it's either in pipes under the ground or there isn't any. Sometimes it's retrofitted. So here's Dolly's um, and they, they dig a trench and they put in a V-shaped concrete channel into the ground. And the idea, well, before that happened, people would walk out the door and just throw the ground water into the street. Now they walk out the door and they throw it into that. They do use it sometimes. So this person has blocked it with a sandbag and he's collecting it to water a garden. Um, that doesn't look too nice to me, what's in there, but still, they, they do use it. So if there is um, rain, uh, uh, rainwater management put in, very often they are these straight concrete channels. There is a document written for Oxfam in which drainage is addressed by saying that um, whatever water is say, produced in the settlement has to be directed to another environment. As long as it's, it's gone out of the, the boundary of the camp and directed to another environment, forget it, it's gone. This could be a downstream host community who might not want to have you know, a refugee camp's waste water directed towards it. Um, if there are problems with flooding, um, they put in massive ditches, gigantic pipes, direct it beyond the camp boundary. Uh, these concrete channels very often rot. Um, they're not, they're, again, they're simply not fit for purpose, so that one's overflowed. Um, okay, so the um, site that they've been given by the UNHCR is uh, at Gowland. Um, so the site is up here, um, and this is the beginning of the area that um, UNHCR said to Mitch and Andy Higo. You can see all of these grey water, oops, one of these grey water channels coming in through here, and then there's another one over here. You can see the problem with waste. 
So we've, we've got long-term rainwater management, this is constant, and then occasional short-term stormwater management. So, uh, and again, you can see there's piles of, of debris from where they built the camp as well. And here we go. So this is a problem, but once it gets to here, it's not, because it's, it's under the boundary. So these are the, the people that live there. Um, this is the area. Um, what, they, what we needed, so that, yeah, there's a population of about 8,000 people there. What we needed was, was some information in order to, to uh, design um, a, a SUDS management train for this area. Yes, it's end of pipe. So it means that whatever's coming out of all of this comes here and then out. And we are hoping, what, what we're hoping, fingers crossed, is that the design we've got will mean that no water will leave that site. That's the, the ambition. Um, so we needed background water sampling. So that was at three sites. Oh. Um, so this is the channel that you saw in the previous photograph. This is the, the channel that's come, the, the one that I pointed out that you couldn't see. And then that's where it all leaves. Um, so we needed water sampling, and this should be ongoing. Um, Mitch did a household survey of water use, um, and then um, he did some workshops, engaged with the community, and uh, got them to design what they wanted. So, so this is a before um, measurement, and you can see the sort of things that were measured, but if we take these, the metals, um, they would be either below the limits of detection or below guidelines. So, um, I mean, we'll carry on measuring those, but I'm not going to talk about those at all. Um, they model pH, um, and as I say, this is pre-construction. But if we look at the ones that um, they used um, standards for that particular area and for, for that um, particular environment. So, turbidity is a bit of a problem, BOD, COD, um, but fecal coliforms. So, people should be using the showers and the toilets that they provided. But they've been bombed out of their homes where they have their own showers and their own toilets in their own house. So what they do is try and replicate that in a UNHCR tent. And so this is why the rainwater actually does get contaminated with fecal coliforms, because people want, you know, want their dignity. Um, but, uh, and again, that sounds like a lot to me, but Stephen will say that perhaps it's not, I don't know. But um, treated wastewater for um, ready, oh, I remember ready-to-eat vegetables uh, should be um, less than 1,000 coliforms per 100 ml. So if they're using it to, to water their vegetables, perhaps they shouldn't, uh, particularly for example number two. Um, but these are still way above. Uh, raw sewage at 10 to the 7 coliforms per 100 ml perhaps gives that a bit of a context. Well, to me, anyway, but that's perhaps not quite so huge, but it does seem quite big to me. Um, so we will continue to monitor the, the water quality at these three sites um, as the um, design is constructed and then into the future. So designing the sets at Gavilan is technically feasible. We could just walk in with the bulldozer and we could just do it. And there it is. And you could say to the people, there you go. And they would go, don't care. But if you make it socially inclusive, then they will, they will have a buy-in to it. They will feel as if they own it, if you like. Um, so this is, this is Kevin's idea. Um, mm -hmm. You need socially responsive drainage to deal with this sort of a scenario. It has to be socially inclusive or eventually it will fail. So Mitch did a household survey of water use and grey water disposal. So what detergents did you use? How often did you wash your clothes? How often do you take a bath? Uh, how many litres do you use? And what do you do with it after use? Do you throw it away? Do you water plants with it? Some water plants with it, um, but lots of people just chucked it out. 
So there's Mitch. Um, so there was a male service committee set up and a female service committee set up. So here he is with the, 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 the male people from the um, service committee talking about their roles as producers of this water, um, but also users of the service that might be provided by the, the service tray. Um, and here he is with the, the women's group, but he had to have men in the women's group to uh, escort them around. So he was not allowed to do it uh, on his own. Um, so he, he did a walk over with the men, he did a walk over with the women. Um, he then had meetings with the men, men's and women's groups separately, um, with their various uh, sort of community committees. Um, asked them, you know, what's your idea of drainage? And they started off talking about pipes and concrete channels. He talked to them about suds. Um, you know, this was over, over several meetings. And eventually, this is the design that they came up with. So you've got tree pits, got to soak away, a swale, some filter trenches, um, a communal urban agriculture site, so there's Andy's um, influence, um, a pond with reeds in it to try and uh, cover the surface. Um, interestingly, um, they wanted an area, a communal area, where they could sit and, and have meetings. Um, these little things here, which I don't know whether you can see, are benches where they wanted to sit under the trees. So that was their final design. Um, you may, uh, lots of you might know Simon Watkins, who did um, a master's here on reimagining refugee camps. And he's a Suds landscape designer. So we said to him, you do, you know, you take that design and you make it into a one that we can follow and, and actually build. So he needed uh, soil and topographic surveys by, uh, so uh, a digital elevation model was produced. Um, and I'm going to whisper because Carol's not here, she'll uh, drone over flies. They did have permission. They were trained. They were our drones. But don't say anything. So this is the soil pit. Um, Mitch used a bit of artistic license, I think, in saying this is the A horizon. The I think that, that it's all just spoil. Um, so that was a bit of a, you know, that's a bit difficult, but you, you work with what you work with. What's the difference, sorry? Between? Well, what you just, spoil or... Um, because, or... because I don't think there's a structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if there was a soil structure, you could work with that. Um, and, you know, it, it shows that it's developing a proper soil, but I, I just think there's a, there's a lot of rubble and rubbish in amongst that. But as I say, it is what it is. There's a lot you can do about it. Uh, they did some infiltration experiments. Um, so that's the digital elevation model. Um, so you can see how steep the terrain actually is. So here's the one coming in. The drainage channel. There's the other one. Uh, the people had already started growing vegetables on that patch. We have left that severely alone. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of ponds. Uh, lots of vegetation. Uh, Mitch has done some YouTube video uh, videos um, of walkovers and and um, what he's uh, found is that there's lots of frogs. There's lots of insects. There's lots of birds. So, you know, in the, in the quiet, you can hear all the birds singing and the frogs chirping away. So that's something to... Um, and so this is the design that's, um, that Simon came up with. So, you know, again, you've got... Here's, here's this communal area with benches, um, tree, trickle trenches, the, the pond, the other pond. Um, lots of trees. He's got great lines planted there. Um, paths to walk around. So this was handed to UNHCR engineers. It was handed to the camp management uh, for their approval, for their advice, for their input, which they had. 
Um, and as I said, no water must leave the site. That's our ambition anyway. So that's what it looked like. And then work began on it on September the 7th, the bulldozer. If I had a WhatsApp from Andy, uh, bulldozers have, have gone in with three smiley faces, yay! Uh, so there's the bulldozer, uh, a sort of fear in the sight, um, terracing it, so that there's flat trees on there. This is all costed into the HIF project, so the, the project pays for the trees and the vegetation and the, and the people. Um, we've, we, well, we have been asked again to have a look at other sites that the UNHCR have suggested, which is that this is particularly uh, Donnie's, for opportunities to retrofit. So things like tree micro catchments, things like the potential for a swale, perhaps there, that's, you know, it's already sort of more or less there, but just needs a bit more um, twiddling with. Um, this is a design by Simon again, using native vegetation, infiltration into the ground. Um, he's suggesting using mulch. But it, you see, if you, if you do this, if you've got large stones and whatnot, you can, they, they can be paths that people can walk on. Because the other thing is, what you don't want to do is suddenly stick something right in the middle of where people usually, you know, like go to the shop or something. Um, whereas they, they could, this could be designed almost like a porous pavement. And of course, Andy's doing his magic as far as stabilisation agriculture is concerned. Um, so again, this is Domi's. Um, but if you can tie this in with sustainable drainage, it, that increases the multiple benefits. Um, so yes, that's my favourite slide. That, uh, again, that's one of Andy's slides. Um, but this lady here had set this garden up. <laughs> reminds her of her childhood and where she's come from. Uh, but it does provide her with food and, and obviously with, with flowers, but connects her with where she's actually from. So again, it's, it's giving people dignity and whatnot. So, very quickly then, um, Favelas, so this is a project, uh, this is a Newton Award, um, with, um, as, oh, with Rebecca as the master's student, um, tackling the Zika virus mosquito. Um, and it's again, so the challenge of density popular water, waste is an issue, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing again, but no wash. And so the idea here is, or the problem is, that there's a lack of a reliable water supply, um, and people therefore, um, in times of short supply of water, will uh, store it in containers in their houses. Um, so this is what the Brazilian side of this project are, are concentrating on, is that these people, yes, they must have a, a reliable source of, of drinking water. Um, short term, which I've never said to, if any of you have met Clarice, you'll know, that I wouldn't say anything to her like this, but short term is put a lid on it. Or get a container with, you know, get the government to supply containers with lids. But anyway, I won't bother with that. Um, what I'm more interested in is this, the standing water, and again, it's grey water, water your front door, chuck it out, uh, and mosquitoes will breathe in that. The other problem with this is um, that, as far as they're concerned, the Zika virus has gone away, um, it's finished, there's no problem anymore, but the Zika virus carrying mosquito also carries other diseases like dengue, chikungunya, um, and a little one was off gone. So we went there last November, we're going there this November. Um, we concentrated in the northeast because that's where the cluster of uh, microcephaly cases, there is a cluster of microcephaly cases around the northeast. Um, um, we went to two um, favelas. Um, Maracanã and uh, Joselina, this is Joselina. Uh, we went with the local, the local authority, uh, we met with the community leader, uh, which ensured that we didn't get shot, which was nice. Um, and you can see the same problem, so a, a drain, an open surface water drain blocked with solid waste. If you could get that under the ground somehow, 
then you know the problem that side of the problem is solved. Then they can go on and solve other problems that are associated with uh, Zika and the other diseases. So whilst we were there, um, there were puddles of standing water, one of which was absolutely boiling with mosquito larvae. Uh, lots of rubbish with water where the mosquitoes will, will breed. And I wouldn't want you to think that it's all crappy like that, because there were you know, there, there's the community leader, there's Clarice, um, and you know, they, some of them have gone to a lot of trouble um, to make their houses look very beautiful. So if we compare them then, the informal settlements, refugee camps, they're both supposed to be temporary, they both end up being permanent. Um, one is self-built, the other one is minutely planned by an NGO. Um, one has wash, one does not. But in both cases, waste is an issue, rainwater is an issue, drainage is an issue, um, and covered fire problems. Um, with uh, the refugee camps, they might go back and retrofit not fit for purpose drainage solutions. Um, no overall government or management as opposed to the, the refugee camps we do have. Um, there is a limited understanding of subs. I'd like to say that now in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, actually, there's a better understanding because of which. Um, so that's good. Um, there are no guidelines in the favelas. Um, there are guidelines for camp planning at the moment, and Arab, who are similarly um, sponsored by HIF, um, <coughs> as, as are we, um, are developing guidelines um, for these uh, refugee camps. And uh, one of the Arab ladies gave a really good talk at Sudsnet the week before last on the development of these guidelines. Um, and then the population is increasing um, in refugee camps, um, but in both cases, um, they're, they're sort of crisis. So they're the poorest, they're the most vulnerable people in the, in the community. And disease vets can be a problem. So, particularly, in countries unfamiliar with SUDS, you need to engage with the community because if you don't, they don't take ownership, and so therefore things like that grey water in the in Langbroek will just simply not be maintained. Um, so it's, it's got to be simple enough to be understood. Um, use existing materials. We were thinking of using post-conflict rubble, um, but I don't know whether we actually got access to that or not in the refugee camps. Uh, but it's got to be robust enough so that people can, you know, it can't be delicate and, and need very sort of delicate uh, maintenance. Um, and then, of course, the other problem is um, it, it has to have something in place. You might get the three-year PhD, and we're all as guilty as anybody of that. Do your three-year PhD or one-year master's or whatever it is, and they just won't quite leave it. Um, you know, you, you need to have something in place to construct it and maintain it. Oh, that's it. So that's the same photograph from the beginning with the girl in the, in the refugee camp with the, the stream of water. 